Lisa. And we're going to mix things up a little bit. Um, you'll hear from both of us throughout the presentation. Um, as Glenda said, though, we are going to um, give you just a brief overview of second language education so that you have some common terms for our presentation today. And then Geely will talk a little bit about the experience in Georgia. I'll offer just a very brief comparison from the United States. We'll share um, the schema that we've shared with you in a hard form already, but we'll highlight a couple of the points there and then leave some time for questions and answers at the end of our presentation. Um, so just to start us off with some key terms, uh, second language acquisition is the term we use to think about how we um, acquire or learn a second language. Um, it is a systematic study. Lots of people examine how it is that we acquire additional languages. Um, but then we can also use what we learn from second language acquisition for second language education, which is actually figuring out how to teach a second language. And when we say second language, it may be a third or fourth or fifth, et cetera. It just means that it's an additional language that is prominently used in that socio-political region. Um, in contrast to a foreign language, which may be learned in that country or region, but is not widely used there. So as a quick example, we have lots of learners of English as a second language in the United States, but then we also have learners of German as a foreign language in the United States. Um, English, of course, is our de facto pseudo-official language in the United States, making it in the second language category when you're talking about the US context, whereas German is not widely spoken in the US, and so it's considered a foreign language in this context. So we want to start with just a couple um, thoughts from you all before we dive into our comparison. Um, why do you all think it is important to pay attention to second language education around the globe? What are some of the reasons that brought you here that might suggest your interest in this topic? Yeah, go ahead. It's that um, English is becoming the language of scholarly publication. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of research that doesn't get widely disseminated because it's just in, in English. And so I think mm -hmm. that's true as well. Absolutely. And there are actually even studies that suggest that if English is your second language, you're less likely to be published because of um, prejudices against those nuances of um, ESL characteristics that show up in our publications. Absolutely. What are some other reasons to pay attention to second language education? We can discuss. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you think of others, um, we'll talk more in the um, question and answer period. Uh, but just briefly, the map that we've included here, the highlighted countries are not the only countries where second language education is a hot topic right now. But there are a couple of examples. Um, we will be talking about two of them, Georgia and the US, but you can see that there are several other countries around the world where this is a really important issue for several reasons, and we can talk more about that when we get to the Q&A. Um, our claim in this presentation, which you'll hear coming out um, and which Geely will unpack momentarily, is that second language education really needs to pay attention to social and cultural competencies in order to move from cultural diversities and conflict to culturally diverse social integration. And there are other types of second language education that may ignore the social and cultural competencies, but we believe that they are not as effective at um, providing social integration. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Geely to unpack that claim a little bit. Thank you, Jesse. Hello, everybody. Uh, I would like to continue our talk. Uh, uh, social and uh, cultural competencies, um, acquis competencies acquisition is uh, really one of the most important uh, distinguished feature for second language education. Uh, but uh, as uh, it was here mentioned, uh, uh, under the certain conditions, uh, the one of the most important, uh, uh, one of the most important uh, point uh, which are uh, are faced in the modern society uh, is the prop in case of ongo or in case of the ongoing process of uh, globalization uh, is the creation uh, indivisible world one of the main uh, features of that uh, can be simplified and 
uh, effective communication. Uh, so necessity to study second language education is emerged automatically, uh, simultaneously with uh, the official language, uh, state language teaching. Necessity of um, uh, study second language education emerged also in case uh, of under the certain conditions of increasing uh, waves uh, of um, immigration from the underdeveloped countries. And on the other side, uh, it can be mentioned that uh, countries with uh, compact settled ethnic minorities uh, confront the problems of uh, the second language uh, study, uh, second language education as well. So it can be said that the problem of second language education is very actual uh, in, uh, in the modern world and uh, under the ongo ongoing processes. So it can be uh, some kind of mention that second language education is one of the most important keys for a process of integration of uh, multilingual society. Uh, and this uh, serves the main basis for construction uh, the tolerance society, is, which is also important. So uh, second language, um, uh, language, state language of proficiency is one of the most important keys, um, or, or other side is one of the most important obstacles uh, which impeded uh, so social integration or the, in case of the multi-language society. So uh, civic integration uh, can be uh, from fulfilled based on the two different, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, at the same time, uh, too much connected uh, different fields, educational policy and social programs. Social programs, implementation of different social programs can be served for, or can be well served for cultural, cultural identity of ethnic groups and uh, on the other side, preservation for cultural identities of these uh, groups. So it is well known that program after program for, uh, from can Canadian immersion programs uh, to uh, Singaporean public schools, um, it is well known all demonstrate that uh, in case of, um, uh, that in case of uh, children can be schooled uh, better, happily and successfully under the uh, social, under the certain social conditions. So this uh, implementation of social programs are very important as well. Uh, and uh, as for educational policy, uh, this uh, some kind of field and activities must be fulfilled based on two uh, based on two topics: uh, so, uh, state language teaching and bilingual education. In many countries, these problems are solved uh, by inculcation of bilingual education. And state language teaching is an important process uh, based on um, uh, the theoretical, methodological, academic, and practical issues as well. Uh, well. And um, it can be said that all these uh, top points are circularly uh, connected to each other and uh, all of them are very important and skipping one of them uh, cannot be give us uh, uh, the, some kind of complete educational policies. These are single language education, educational policies, multilingual authentics and international relationships. Uh, it's also important when we are talking about the second language education uh, to consider uh, the multilingual envir envir environment where the, uh, the main linguistic uh, outcomes, uh, um, how they are connected uh, and uh, what are the connections between the uh, different languages. It can be language maintenance, bilingualism and language shifts. So in, our, in case of our talk, we will consider all of these topics connected to each other and we'll we try to show you the, uh, the main uh, pictures based on uh, Georgian and the state data. So uh, I will continue. <laughs> okay, before I will start talking about the Georgian educational policy, I would like to shortly introduce, but most of them knows approximately uh, about Georgia, some uh, thing about Georgia. Uh, the country is located uh, uh, along the uh, Caucasian mountain bridge. Uh, our boundaries are Black Sea, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Russia. And the main traditions of Georgia are Georgian banquet, uh, Georgian uh, banquet tradition, vine, uh, vine and vineyard culture, and the most featureable traditions for Georgian are Georgian hospitality and uh, generosity, so you are warmly welcome to Georgia. <laughs> And uh, I would like also give shortly uh, general information of Georgia. The total population of the country consists of uh, 4.7 4 million. Uh, capital of the country is Pilisi, state language is Georgian. Main religion is 
Orthodox Christianity and society is multicultural, multi-ethnic, and tolerant. So it can be said that Georgia is one of the most culturally diverse countries in the world, where the ethnic minorities constitute just the significant part of the total population. According to the, to the latest census, uh, the amount of ethnic minorities uh, can form 16.2% of the total population. The largest, uh, the lar one of the largest uh, group of ethnic minorities are ethnic Azerbaijanis, after uh, ethnic Georgians. Uh, the total amount uh, constitutes 6.5% of the total amount. Most of them are located uh, in uh, Marneuli, uh, and uh, they, there they constitute 83% of the total population. Uh, the other biggest group of uh, uh, ethnic minorities are ethnic minor ethnic uh, Armenians. They are uh, 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 the biggest, largest amount of them can be found in Aninatumida and Akhalkalaki. These are west south part of Georgia, where uh, they constitute more than 85 percent of the total population. And what about the low pro language proficiency and state uh, and the level of integration? It's, uh, it depends on the different regions. In the in case of densely populated regions, uh, there can be found a low level of uh, civic integration. And uh, with the regard uh, of uh, proficiency in the knowledge of, uh, of the state language, uh, the better situation can be found uh, uh, in the uh, disparate uh, set in settlements of ethnic minorities, uh, where the ethnic minorities know uh, no English, uh, no Georgian, <laughs> no Georgian, uh, where they have a good knowledge of uh, the state language, uh, and in some cases they are some kind of uh, uh, as good as native speakers. Uh, it's, uh, the, the question can be raised uh, naturally: What are the main reasons of such conditions? For the first of all, it can be um, it, it's is a, a big uh, significant part of the Soviet heritage when Georgian was last used um, uh, in the capacity of uh, the general uh, general communication language. Instead, uh, Russian and ethnic minorities languages, uh, Azerbaijani and uh, Armenian, was used uh, more, more more actively. That's why the population. Uh, the ethnic minorities had um, a lack of motivation uh, to learn to study Georgian as a state language well. The main reason also of it also uh, can be the monolingual education in that period. There were uh, Georgian and uh, ethnic minorities languages uh, were in language schools and in ethnic minority language schools in Armenian, Russian and uh, Azerian uh, schools, Georgian was taught as one class you know, Georgian language and literature, uh, they had a um, program, a unified program, they had uh, just a one class, and uh, lack of um, good textbooks and uh, methodologies uh, was the major obstacles um, for low uh, level of Georgian language teaching. Uh, but uh, after the two, dec two and more <laughs> decades of independence situation, uh, there uh, had uh, uh, drastic changes uh, were made, and um, in case of uh, essentially and uh, very important uh, reforms, uh, radical reforms uh, situation has slightly changed. Uh, the first step of reforms were the legislation uh, support of the second language education. These are the most important steps uh, in that case were ratification of the European framework conventions for the protection of uh, ethnic national minorities. Also was very important step uh, ratification of language uh, of national policy and action plan for tolerance uh, and uh, civic society uh, civic integration after that uh, this one legislation was a big uh, was a, a very helpful for implementation other important steps and while most uh, important is implementation of an effective and structured state policy and establishment of a uh, coherent and adequate institutional system also can be mentioned um, that the biggest goal in that case um, is uh, that um, is uh, is um, have organized um, uh, a language uh, ethnic minorities related minority related uh, steps and uh, activities uh, under um, under common under co one common drive uh, is uh, a biggest um, goals of a single some kind of activities. Uh, so uh, before. Uh, 
instead uh, oppositely before uh, the uh, main activities and strategy strategies uh, were split uh, under the uh, different uh, educational systems. That's why it was the main obstacles for uh, fulfillment um, uh, strong educational policy. Uh, and as for civil integration and ethnic minority protection issues, it can be said that one of uh, the uh, important was uh, the um, implement uh, educational policy between the uh, second language education policy between the different uh, entities, legislation entities. And uh, one of the most important uh, ministries can be mentioned as follows, Ministry of Education and Science, Minister of Cultural and uh, Monument uh, Protection, and Office of the State Minister of Reintegration. This last uh, is uh, one of the uh, is uh, responsible for monitoring and coordination between interministry uh, working and activities. The Ministry of Ed Education, Ministry of Culture and Monument Protection, um, is responsible for for preserve preservation of uh, cultural um, identities of language minorities. There is the, under this uh, uh, ministry, uh, there are established uh, centers for language minorities, centers for uh, minorities, ethnic minorities, uh, cultures. Uh, they are aimed uh, at support, development, and uh, protect uh, cultural uh, identities of ethnic minorities, at enhancing uh, the, the cultural dialogues between the representatives of different ethnic minority groups, and at support uh, integration in Georgian cultural space uh, through the cultural, these cultural centers. And one of the most key uh, institutions responsible for uh, second implementing the second language educational policy is, of course, Ministry of Education and Science, which uh, delivered different, which launched different uh, programs, uh, educational programs on different educational and institution levels. And responsible in institutions in, ca in case of educational uh, system can be mentioned as follows, Ministry of Education and Science, National Curricular and Assessment Center, National Center for Teacher Professional Development, and Nature Examination, National Examinations Center, and some more others. And the general concept of educational policy co covers all institutional and of all educational levels of second language, uh, in case of second language education. There are preschool education, school, high uh, education, higher education, adult education, and teachers' houses. Uh, in case of, uh, on the preschool level, it must be mentioned that most important step was adaptation of uh, a curriculum. Uh, in case of schooling, uh, the most important step was establishment and inculcation of uh, bilingual education. Uh, in case of higher education, there was important uh, uh, modified modification of entrance exams uh, for national minority students. Also, adult education uh, uh, delivered the special training programs for civic sense, national minority civic uh, servants, and uh, school principals. Uh, the, the, mono, the biggest novelty was establishment teacher houses where they can support ethnic minorities, allow teachers uh, with um, uh, materials, different materials, and different uh, task-oriented uh, task trainings. I'm going to interrupt you just very briefly to say I think those teacher houses concepts are really a fascinating idea that um, we could learn a lot from in the United States, so I hope that Gila gets to talk more about that later in the session. Okay, thank you. And teacher minority, uh, teacher houses really work well uh, in this uh, topic, uh, and we can uh, discuss it later. Uh, one of the most important steps also where was uh, bilingual education, and the main concept of that was uh, um, my integration national minorities through multilingual education, multilingual mm -hmm. teaching programs, and um, uh, the typing, uh, type of the schools uh, was uh, uh, some kind of, uh, has changed a little, and now uh, this it's important that 30% of subjects are taught um, in Georgian language, mostly of them, most of them are social subjects, and Georgian history um, is um, teaching in such schools uh, on, in Georgian language. As for teaching materials, is one of the important parts of the generally second language education. Uh, it's important that it's adapted curricula for Georgian as a second language, uh, and also text uh, books. Uh, 
uh, the, according to the Lean's concept, the textbooks must support uh, diverse uh, thinking and try diverse outlook among students and must be based on non-stereotyped cultural diversity uh, conceptions. Uh, a later, has, has in case uh, of the second language education policy, they were started uh, translation of textbooks. It was divided, uh, fulfilled uh, on the two levels. Uh, and also, uh, it's important that um, one of the different type of te textbooks uh, were textbooks with 30% uh, of Georgian language materials. And um, uh, also, we have uh, textbooks for Georgian as a second language in some cases. Uh, I will. I uh, want to pay your attention uh, on the different teacher support programs. What is going on in Georgia for um, help teachers uh, with second language education environment? Uh, first of all, the, one of the important programs. Uh, uh, um, so, um, supported by a Minister of Education is a qualified Georgian language specialist in the schools of the ethnic minority inhabited uh, regions. It means that uh, there were, after, after the competition, ser several amount of uh, the teachers were uh, chosen. They had a uh, uh, practice, uh, they had a training courses in uh, multicultural um, education, multi multicultural studies, and also ethnic minorities languages, Armenian and Azerbaijan lang languages. And uh, in case of a several uh, special amount, they were served the schools in ethnic, uh, ethnic minorities inhabited uh, territories. Uh, the second um, uh, program for teachers is the Teach and Learn Georgian language, uh, which means uh, which supports language ma ethnic minorities uh, to um, uh, to get a high proficiency of Georgian language uh, and uh, teach Georgian language in such specific schools and Georgian literature. Uh, and Teach for Georgia is a unified program for uh, teachers uh, in, spa in hard uh, territories, in hard regions in mountains, and uh, ethnic uh, minorities compact settled uh, also regions. Uh, if uh, I want to emphasize the different programs for teach, uh, for student support. Uh, for uh, the most important step was uh, transformation of United Nations exams of uh, for, for national minorities. Uh, they can now they can uh, pass uh, one exam on their own languages, uh, uh, the general skills tests um, in Armenian and Azerbaijani languages, and they can in, be enrolled um, in a different bachelor programs. But before they are um, they are obligated to uh, have a Georgian language uh, training course, one year training course. This is support of uh, the government and the uh, Ministry of Education. And um, uh, with a special program, they can, um, uh, they can make their uh, level of pro proficiency of sta state language um, a little bit higher. And after that, uh, have a lectures, uh, dealing with lectures in different institutions and um, uh, universities. Uh, and uh, I want to summarize my talk uh, with uh, positive outcomes of the uh, uh, reforms uh, in the second language institutions. First of all, it must be mentioned that it's, it is very important for the law support uh, for this uh, for the further activities, uh, law support was the um, main uh, some kind of point for um, increasing the motivation of uh, the. Uh, language of the uh, ethnic minorities, uh, and uh, it's also important to me for it's worth to mention that strong in the institutional system has been established uh, for schooling level. It's very important bilingual education system implementation. Uh, modified entrance exams for ethnic minorities are also uh, uh, are also very mentionable in that case, and different training programs which are fulfilled uh, in many diverse uh, cases is very helpful for the increasing the field. And uh, still can we find some problems and challenges uh, uh, in, this, um, in case of uh, 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 the refor reforms, the uh, low language of uh, uh, proficiency of state language can be still a little bit uh, low in that case. Um, and um, it's also important to improve theoretical issues and methodologies uh, and apply them uh, in case of uh, bilingual education, bilingual schools and higher education uh, and special training programs. Um, international experience can be applied more in that case also. Uh, text, of course, there are many textbooks and teaching materials, but 
Um, it's important to um, modify them according to the modern standards as well the improvement of the of the programs of Georgian and second language in institutions of high how in the institutions of higher education for teacher programs uh, in the second language education it can be, it was short for information short information about the uh, second language education in Georgia so thank you very much we can discuss it later <laughs> and uh, Jesse will present so I think most of you are probably most interested in the Georgian experience because it is outside of our reference um, and something new for us to learn about. But to facilitate a comparison, I'm going to talk just very briefly about ESL second language education in the United States. Uh, this is a uh, map from the Census Bureau showing where um, populations of uh, residents who speak languages other than English are located. And you can see that the um, mass percentage is along the southern part of the US, but then there are also pockets in Illinois where Chicago is, um, New York City, um, and other parts of New England. So just a little uh, figure to get us started. Um, there are, I'm going to focus on two different types of programs that somewhat parallel what Geely was telling us about the Georgian experience starting with second language programs at the, at the uh, K-12 level and college level, and then talking about some teacher preparation programs. So in the United States, we have ESL programs, including bilingual education programs in K-12. through And here's really where we see some of the most variation. We certainly have bilingual programs like the one down the street at Elon, education, or Elon Elementary, where students are learning Spanish and also then learning English. Um, that particular bilingual program is different from some of the others we see around the country where we may have native speakers of English and native speakers of another language, both learning each language um, and different ratios of how much time is spent in each language. All of those are types of immersion programs. In addition to immersion programs, we have pull-out programs where students might be taken out of a class and meet with an ESL specialist for anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour a day. And then we also have sheltered ESL classes where, depending on the model, students are either with a larger group of ESL students and learning both content and language, or they're mainstreamed, but the mainstream classroom is more attentive to diverse learners' needs. Um, and that model, sheltered models, um, are probably one of the most prevalent models in the US, but we still also have a lot of pullout classes as well. Bilingual or immersion programs are probably the least um, popular model right now. Not that they aren't good programs, there's a lot of science behind them, but they're difficult to implement and it's often difficult to get public support for them. ESL programs in K through 12 are also where we see the most impact of legislation and other educational policies. Um, as a quick run through in, um, well, the Equal Educational Opportunities Act was the first major piece of legislation to impact ESL education. Um, it set the way to say we need to provide equal access, equal opportunity for all of our learners regardless of their background, regardless of their language, regardless of their ethnicity. Um, it wasn't until Lau versus Nichols in 1974, um, though, that we really had some push on that. In that particular court case, um, the for, um, plaintiffs successfully argued that it's not enough to simply give the same classroom materials. Just because we give non-native speakers and native speakers the same desks and chairs does not mean that we're providing them the same opportunity for education that when there's a language difference, that we also need to account for that language difference in order to successfully provide equal education. Um, that was followed up with some other court cases that pushed the issue further. Um, most recently, in the leg legislation that you're probably most familiar with, No Child Left Behind also has um, aspects of it that are directed towards language learners. Unfortunately, many of them are often, often punitive. Um, they set up cases where districts can lose money if they don't support their English language learners, as opposed to 
setting up a case where there's some kind of reward for progress. Um, so that's kind of a downside. One other thing I'll mention with ESL programs for K through 12, they're often also the target of citizen action movements um, that can be positive or negative. Um, for instance, in California in 1997 and 1998, we saw an initiative called Proposition 227, English for the Children, which on the surface sounds lovely. Um, it was spearheaded by a millionaire who knew nothing about education, but thought that it was insane that um, students were spending so much time away from native speakers when they were learning a language. Um, and it ultimately successfully outlawed bilingual education in the state of Cal California unless parents could um, gather enough signatures to petition for an exemption. Um, that movement, which is part of the English only movement and a sub movement called English for the Children, um, then repeated itself in several other states. In some, like Massachusetts, it was successful. In others, like Colorado, it was not. Um, Colorado said, no, let's embrace this um, language diversity and let's pick the programs that best fit our students and our local context. Um, but often if you are hearing about second language education in the news, it's at this K through 12 level. However, we also have programs for students at the college and university level, not so much on our local campus. Our numbers are just not um, sufficient and I'll get to, to that in just a moment. Um, but often in larger research one institutions, you'll see if not language institutes, you'll see um, ESL classes to support both undergraduate and graduate students learning English for academic purposes. Many of our communities have ESL programs. We've got several local churches right here in Alamance County, for instance, who support um, ESL classes. Uh, and then we also have some service learning initiatives um, based here at Elon um, at the university to support ESL students and their families in the local community. And that's not uncommon. And then I put here also Spanish language programs. Um, this not everyone ag would agree with me on, but we're getting to a point where Spanish is prevalent enough in our local context that I think it could be counted as a second language and that our education in teaching people to speak Spanish could be considered second language education rather than foreign language education. Um, but again, that's a contentious point. So. Uh, the other category of programs in the US is teacher education programs. Um, as I mentioned, I'm very interested in the teacher houses that Keely mentioned. In the US, we tend to focus on one of two things when we're talking about teacher preparation, either preparing K through 12 teachers to work either in mainstream classes with just a few ESL learners, or we also have more extensive programs geared at preparing teachers to work exclusively with ESL learners. We also have some programs that are geared towards helping you know, students teach abroad, um, either short term or long term. Here at Elon, we have one class called Introduction to TESOL um, offered every other year that tries to do both of these things. And again, it's just a numbers issue. We don't have the demand for broader programs than that. But there are places where you can earn a bachelor's or a master's in TESOL or even work on a PhD. Some of the challenges for ESL and second language education in the United States, um, particularly at the K through 12 level, we have in ended up with two categories of teachers. We have mainstream teachers and then ESL specialists. And that divide has often led to different funding structures for the programs, for the teachers, for their assistants, um, different staff lines, different resources, um, different classroom structures. Um, at Elon Elementary, just as a quick example, the ESL classroom is an old supply closet. So there's a lot of, um, tension between how resources are used for these two groups. And it's not, it's not always a negative tension. Often people balance it quite well. But you can see when you look at many of these programs that we're not necessarily funding ESL education as much as we perhaps should to best support these students and best give them that equal educational opportunity. 
the other challenging thing is with separate lines for ESL teachers and mainstream teachers or content teachers, we often make it difficult for those two groups to collaborate. They often don't have the same preparation times, um, if they have any prep times. They often don't have people who can um, tend to other responsibilities while they meet to talk about how to best serve a student's needs. And so it gets very complicated for these professionals to collaborate in the best interests of the students. And they go out of their way to try to do that, but we don't make it easy for them. We still have a fair amount of lack of faculty expertise in ESL. More and more states are now requiring some type of ESL certification, but that's not widespread yet. And a lot of programs have had to kind of um, react quickly to try and provide ESL certification. So now the profession is playing catch up in terms of what good certification should look like and what's actually needed. We, in our country, still have a lot of conflicts about cultural preservation versus assimilation. Um, and a lot of ESL teachers would like to see cultural preservation with integration into society, but not assimilation that ignores the cultural roots. Um, and that's often the source of some of the tensions of the political movements that I mentioned earlier, um, the push towards assimilation as opposed to cultural preservation. <coughs> and then, as I mentioned, we have a very strong English-only movement um, that can often do damage to the educational opportunities for our students. And you can hear my bias there. <laughs> um, here at Elon, we have a Department of Foreign Languages to support foreign language students and also Spanish students. Um, but we don't necessarily have the same central location to support second language students. We have the Isabella Cannon International Center, who's represented, um, to help students with that transition to the United States and to help with a lot of the logistical issues. We have the Writing Center and the English 110 College Writing Program to help with some of the early writing challenges that students might face. Um, the Tutoring Center often takes on a role of helping um, ESL students with issues related to their academic English. Um, but more and more it falls to the faculty to help students identify these resources and take advantage of them. And then also connect these resources or extend the scope of these resources to the content area. So there's a lot of um, responsibility on the faculty here at Elon to help our international students and not necessarily a lot of coordinated effort yet to help those faculty in that role. Um, and that's something that we're hoping to help address on Friday um, if any of you would like to come to our Friday workshop. So there's a quick snapshot of the second language ac education in the US. Um, and this is uh, reproduced on your handout, but we wanted to briefly uh, mention some of the similarities and differences between these two contexts side by side. Mm -hmm. First of all, we would like to uh, compare the uh, statistics uh, according to the field. Uh, in Georgia, there is a big amount of ethnic minorities, um, and so as well, uh, mm -hmm. this tot total amount, amount of ethnic minorities can be high. Uh, educational politics uh, and legislation support is very high in Georgia. Uh, and the same can be said um, in case of the states. And also we would like to mention uh, language, state language proficiency between uh, the language of ethnic minorities. Uh, in Georgia, it depends, uh, uh, the re depends on the regions where are densely populated or not uh, ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about the states? <laughs> in the states, it, um, it's a little bit more complex. We can't quite specify uh, language proficiency based on geographic region or how densely populated an area is. But you can see that all in all, um, those who speak another language still have fairly high proficiency in English. Only 8% um, of those who speak another language at home don't speak English at all. Um, and you can see about 80% speak it well or very well. So that's pretty high proficiency. Uh, and uh, also, we would like uh, to continue our talk uh, about uh, the uh, 
with the assistance adapting um, and the difference um, education level. In Georgia, the most um, actively education uh, policy, policy um, is that and second language education issues are adapted on the school level and also at the high level, uh, higher educational level. And in the U.S., we have a lot of variation in our approaches across these levels. Uh, really, it's uh, rather than a countrywide effort, there's a lot more localized um, choices about instruction. And uh, as for the teaching materials and textbooks in Georgia, we have translated textbooks, uh, uh, bilingual um, uh, textbooks, and also textbooks for Georgian uh, is, a foreign, uh, is a second language. And in the U.S., we have a thriving ESL textbook industry, um, and it varies from region to region and school to school how much they can tap that. Uh, and also in Georgia, uh, there are strongly and structured uh, prog support programs for teachers, uh, students, and adults. And these programs are implemented step, step by step and uh, work well. And you can see in a parallel fashion that the U.S. also supports teachers, students, and adults um, with very lengthy programs. And our um, conclusion... The most important conclusion <laughs> <of> ours, <laughs> <laughs> As we were working through this comparison, one of the things we noticed is that Georgia seems to have a second language education program that does a pretty good job of facilitating um, cultural and social competencies and achieving culturally diverse social integration. Yeah, so there is a main line uh, and uh, the Georgia national policy and um, uh, active plan uh, considers to preserve uh, germ, uh, and respect ethnic minorities' uh, cultural identities. This is the main uh, one of the most important points uh, of the educational policy of the country. And in contrast, the United States has some programs that do this pretty well, but in part because we are so varied, we also have programs that don't. And one of the main challenges we have in terms of thinking about culturally diverse social integration is that we do so often keep our ESL programs separate from mainstream education that it makes it hard to reach a total population with a message of social integration. And so we seem to be working with the students who we'd like to be socially integrated but able to preserve their culture rather than working with the students who could be welcoming to their um, cultural identities. So in the, in the end, <laughs> we just would claim that uh, single language education is strongly connected with uh, culture, with adapting cultural and uh, social competencies, and, uh, which is the main key for the social integration in the multicultural society. So thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes for questions, if we can field any from you. <laughs> Jesse, you mentioned that some of the programs in the U.S. are doing a good job at uh, the second language teaching, and so I wondered if you would, could talk about those, and I also wanted to hear more about the teacher housing in Georgia, so one question for each of you. So as a quick example, in um, Colorado, there is a bilingual education program that invites 50% English speakers and 50% Spanish speakers. And the school has English days and Spanish days. And as you work through the grade levels, you um, flip the percentage of time you spend in each language of instruction. But by the time you graduate the eighth grade, you're proficient and fluent in both languages and academically on track with your peers for entering high school. And so it's a setup that does a really nice job of respecting and valuing both languages, but then also celebrating the cultures that are represented by both languages and recognizing that it's cultures plural for each language. Um, so that's one example of a program that does a really nice job of respecting the languages, respecting the cultures, supporting all of the students and also bringing families into the process as well. 
And thank you <laughs> for your second <laughs> question, April. Um, uh, as a teacher's house is one of the um, interesting and uh, important, uh, some kind of novel novelty implied last year. Um, it means uh, that it is, a, it is a teacher house is a, a supporting uh, place uh, for teachers um, as well. And of course, it's very useful, useful for um, uh, the second language teachers and in such uh, hard, uh, complexly settled uh, areas uh, by uh, language uh, ethnical minorities. Um, it means that uh, teachers uh, during the 24 hours uh, can come, uh, use uh, the facilities, uh, technical, uh, have technical support as well. Uh, there can be provided and uh, deliver delivering different trainings uh, for um, uh, uh, improving their qualification and uh, div uh, according to the different uh, tasks. Uh, um, and um, as I said already, it's well, most important um, can be for the second language minor uh, education teachers and uh, for teachers of language minorities uh, so because uh, their language proficiency can be somehow uh, a little bit low, even if they teach Georgian language. And teacher house, this help them a lot in that, in a there are ways. Yeah. Okay, question. Well, we would like to thank Jesse and Gurley for this presentation. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot, not only about uh, Georgia, <laughs> but also America. So it's been a nice, really uh, good comparison. So let's give them a round of applause again. <laughs> And we do hope that if you're interested in um, learning how to support your students in your classrooms, that you'll come back on Friday. We'll be over in Curry Business Center, and we'll have an interactive workshop on supporting language learners in your classrooms. And please invite others that you think might uh, appreciate that workshop. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, thank you. <laughs>